Hello everyone. It's good to be putting up my first video since I got back from vacation, uh, but unfortunately my laptop uh, is not doing too well this Saturday afternoon, so the worship service you're about to see will not uh, have any music in it. I apologize for that. It's just going to be me and my face. Uh, so please uh, search for something, uh, listen to something, and worship God with song in your own way. And I would encourage you, if you feel safe, to uh, start coming out to worship again. I uh, hope this is a blessing. Bye. The steadfast love of the Lord never ceases, and his mercies never come to an end. They are new every morning. Great is God's faithfulness. This is a service for Sunday, July the 25th, uh, but just a couple announcements before we begin. Um, just one announcement for this Sunday in person. Uh, we are maintaining all of the safety protocols required of us as a church, but we've decided that it's time to begin singing again uh, in stage three. Uh, so we'll be singing congregationally with our masks on and at a conversational level, uh, but I'm very excited that we can do that together again in person. Uh, also, next week, August the 1st, and for the rest of the month of August, uh, it's finally time for uh, the two church communities of Patterson Memorial and Laura Lee St. Matthews uh, to get to worship together as we've uh, been planning and hoping for uh, for so long. Um, we're going to meet here at Laura Lee St. Matthews, 837 Exmouth Street at 10.30 a.m. all together for the whole month of August. So 10.30 in the morning here at Laura Lee St. Matthews for August, and then 10.30 in the morning uh, all together at Patterson for the month of September. Uh, and I would just encourage you, if you uh, feel safe at this stage of the pandemic, please come out, uh, especially if you haven't been uh, for a long time. It'd be wonderful to see you, and it's uh, really important that uh, both churches show up for one another. Uh, so uh, it'd be very exciting to see you in person. Now let's uh, begin to worship God together uh, and praise God even uh, though we are physically separate. Let us pray. Holy and loving God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, we praise you on this day for the chance to worship, for the chance for each one of us individually to join our hearts to you, to you join our hearts to your heart, O oh Lord. We praise you that you know each one of us, love each one of us. We praise you for the gift of salvation, of rescue in Jesus Christ, the gift of a power and new life in your Holy Spirit. We praise you that this is an offer to us, that if we were the only person in the world, you still would have sent your son to die for us because your love has no limits. And God of the church, God of us all, we praise you that you did not send Jesus into the world to save just one of us. You sent him to save all of us together. We praise you that we are made brothers and sisters with each other, with people that are like us and people that are are so different than us. You have made them family. You have made us all family through adoption in Jesus Christ. Lord God, we praise you that you've made us to be together. And so help us to worship now as a church, even uh, sitting in our own living rooms, even physically separate. May we be one body with one another in one or two congregations, and with your whole church throughout the world, make us one in our praise of you, O Lord our God. And Lord, we thank you that your presence and your power uh, convicts us of sin and teaches us what we need to change in our lives. Loving God, we know we've done wrong and need your help. Show us um, the truth about ourselves and the truth about ourselves in you. 
we confess that so often we turn our own pleasures, our own ambitions, our own um, politics, our own culture into gods before you. And that's hurt us, Lord. It's hurt the people around us. It's hurt our planet. And Lord God, it grieves your heart as our only God and our maker. We are sorry. Sorry for the damage we've done. And we confess to you that we, we cannot change on our own. So we ask you to forgive us and make us whole and make us holy through Christ our Lord. Send your spirit of new life upon each one of us and send your spirit of new life upon us as a community that we can be followers of Jesus together, that we can love with his love in this world, that we can share that love all around us. This we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Hear the good news of the gospel. In Christ, you are forgiven. In Christ, you are made new. And in Christ, you are called into his community of saints to love him and serve him. Receive this gift of Christ and know God's peace. Amen. Our scripture reading today uh, is a continuation of the series that was begun before I went on a, a three-week vacation um, just these last few weeks on encountering God and the changes that that will bring in our lives. Uh, and today we read from Acts chapter 9, starting at verse 1. Uh, this is a story of a man named Saul who will later change his name to Paul. I may mix those up in my sermon. Uh, and just recently, he's been the, uh, the Pharisee, the religious official, uh, overseeing the uh, stoning to death of one of the early Christian martyrs, Stephen. And now we uh, join the story of this persecutor of the church in chapter 9. Meanwhile, Saul was uttering threats with every breath and was eager to kill the Lord's followers. So he went to the high priest. He requested letters addressed to the synagogues in Damascus, asking for their co cooperation in the arrest of any followers of the way he found there. He wanted to bring them, both men and women, back to Jerusalem in chains. As he was approaching Damascus on this mission, a light from heaven suddenly shone down around him. He fell to the ground and heard a voice saying to him, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? Who are you, Lord? Saul asked. And the voice replied, I am Jesus, the one you are persecuting. Now get up and go into the city and you will be told what you must do. The men with Saul stood speechless, for they heard the sound of someone's voice, but saw no one. Saul picked himself up off the ground, and when he opened his eyes, he was blind. So his companions led him by the hand to Damascus. He remained there blind for three days and did not eat or drink. Now there was a believer in Damascus named Ananias. The Lord spoke to him in a vision, calling, Ananias. Yes, Lord, he replied. The Lord said, Go over to Straight Street, to the house of Judas. When you get there, ask for a man from Tarsus named Saul. He is praying to me right now. I have shown him a vision of a man named Ananias coming in and laying hands on him, so he can see again. But Lord, exclaimed Ananias, I've heard many people talk about the terrible things this man has done to the believers in Jerusalem, and he's authorized by the leading priests to arrest everyone who calls upon your name. But the Lord said, Go. For Saul is my chosen instrument 
to take my message to the Gentiles and to kings, as well as to the people of Israel. And I will show him how much he must suffer for my name's sake. So Ananias went and found Saul. He laid his hands on him and said, Brother Saul, the Lord Jesus, who appeared to you on the road, has sent me so that you might regain your sight and be filled with the Holy Spirit. Instantly, something like scales fell from, Paul's, from Saul's eyes, and he regained his sight. Then he got up and was baptized. Afterward, he ate food, some food and regained his strength. Saul stayed with the believers in Damascus for a few days, and immediately he began preaching about Jesus in the synagogues, saying, He is indeed the Son of God. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. O Holy Spirit, speak to us with uh, power. Open your scriptures that we've just read to our hearts and help them change us. And Holy Spirit, help me to preach with faithfulness and love and truth. This we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Have you ever been driving or walking or whatever and discovered that you've been going down a, a dead-end road for a while? Right? The last however many kilometers has been a waste of time because there's, there's no actual way to go further on the path you've been on. Um, it's a frustrating feeling, uh, and it's one we use in a lot of metaphors, right? A dead-end job, a dead-end relationship. Uh, but that moment of, oh, I've got to turn around is, is not a good one. Um, and sometimes it's simple, right? You just do a three-point turn, and off you go. You find a new job, uh, as though that's easy. Uh, and sometimes it's, uh, it's really hard and can be really scary. Uh, the freakiest story I've heard about that uh, is from my brother-in-law. When he was a young teenager, he decided, for some reason, that he wanted to swim into a pool that had the cover on. And he thought, I'll swim under the cover and come out on the other side of the cover. And so it's nighttime, I think it was, and it's dark and he swims underwater the length of this pool and comes up and discovers that the cover is attached at the other end. And he's trapped underwater. And uh, this is not the story of his death. Uh, but it is a story where he had to turn around and swim hard the other way because there was no way out uh, at that dead end. Um, and sometimes we don't want to admit dead ends. Uh, and sometimes if, if we hit one, we just want to stop and stay there. And I mentioned dead-end jobs or relationships, but spiritually, we can also hit dead ends where we stop growing, stop changing, stop expecting God to do something new in us. And continuing uh, this series on encounters with God uh, ways God meets us and changes us. The story we read today about Saul, who will become the Apostle Paul and go on all these amazing missionary journeys and, and write for us many books of our New Testament, uh, some of the most influential, life-changing books that have ever been written. Uh, they're a story of him meeting Jesus and getting out of a dead end. Now, he doesn't know he's in one at the start of this story. Saul uh, has been arresting, rounding up, and helping to put to death uh, Christians, although that name for us wouldn't come till a little bit later, uh, followers of Jesus. Um, and Paul is certain 
he's the good guy. He seems like a young, hotshot, very gifted uh, religious leader who's armed with certainty and purpose that these people claiming that the Messiah has come and died and has risen are a danger to the, the purity of faith in which he's been raised. And so for God, out of zeal and passion for God, He's arresting and putting Christians to death. And he's certain that he's right. He's confident that he's doing what's necessary and good. And so he gets papers from the high priest in Jerusalem letting him round up Christians in what's now Syria in a new city in Damascus and goes on a trip that he thinks he knows the end of. But the trip he starts is a dead end. He just doesn't know it. And when we go into our relationship with God... Um, certain that we know the limits of God's grace. Certain that we know the miracles that God will and won't do. Certain that we've found our plateau of I'm faithful enough, good enough. We're in a dead end too. Thanks be to God, Saul walks smack in to Jesus. Saul meets Jesus on the road to Damascus. Now, Jesus has already died and already risen and already ascended into heaven. He's not walking around uh, at this stage in the Bible here on earth. And actually, it's seems like Jesus doesn't leave heaven to appear to Paul. It seems like, the, you know, a, a hole is torn in our world and the light of heaven shines for, sorry, I called him Paul, Saul. He's not Paul yet. The light of heaven shines for Saul to see. And it stops Paul dead on his dead-end road to Damascus. And Jesus changes everything when he says, Saul, Saul. Notice he knows his name. Right? God knows your name too. God knows the path that you're walking on and the path that he has for you. Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me. And Saul, dumbstruck by the light of heaven, can only ask, who are you, Lord? He says, I'm Jesus. And he repeats again, whom you are persecuting. I'm the one you're hurting. Now get up and I'll tell you what to do in a bit. Saul, meets the resurrected Jesus and it changes his life. He'll change his name. Uh, he won't change his religion, by the way. He, this isn't him like stopping being a Jew and starting being a Christian. It changes his path. He's now becoming a follower of Jesus instead of an enemy of Jesus. He'll give him a new lease on life. Get him off a dead-end road. And those moments where Jesus comes and convicts us and says, stop, this is not the path for you, those are gifts. I don't know if you've ever had a, like one moment 
that changed your life, that you can tell that story. But I've had a couple. And I know they happen for many people. And God does have them before us. God will show up and change our lives if, if we're willing to seek. And sometimes that's where the story ends. In fact, in the lectionary, in a guideline for when different scripture readings should be read in different parts of the church year, uh, it actually, one version ends with Paul, Saul. <laughs> with Saul being told, okay, now go to Damascus and I'll tell you what to do, as though that's the end of the story. But where I'd like to go further is this is a story of Jesus appearing to Saul in glory and power, but it doesn't end there. And I'll ask, just Jesus showing up on the road. Um, actually, sometimes uh, since then, we call life-changing experiences Damascus Road experiences because of this uh, story. But is Paul's life saved on the road? Right. When, when, G, when he finishes seeing Jesus, where is he left? Blind and helpless. Right. He's heard directly from the Lord that he's on a dead-end path, but that vision by itself doesn't get him on a new path. And for a moment, I'll go back to that dead-end road. Um, have you ever been on a dead-end road, driving along, towing something that, if this road's not going anywhere, you can't turn around? I remember working on a farm one summer as a young man, uh, driving a... a golf cart, farm vehicle thing, towing two big um, wagons full of uh, potted plants. Uh, and I pulled into the wrong place and couldn't go forward anymore. And I'm not good enough to back up with two uh, wagons attached to the back of this thing. I drove down a dead end and got stuck. And unfortunately, life today has so many dead ends to get stuck in. A, a, addiction is plaguing our city. Not just our city, unfortunately. Addiction is plaguing our world right now. And people don't want to be in there, but you start down that path and you're stuck. And here's the key to the biggest problems and my little problem with the wagons and the key to Saul's story. When you get stuck, you can't get out of it on your own. I had to swallow my pride and go ask someone to help me. And they did. And I got out of there. Saul meets Jesus in person as a vision from heaven, and it changes his life enough to stop the way he's going. But Jesus won't start something new on his own. Because sometimes we get obsessed with just one-on-one, -on -one, our relationship with Jesus, and it's all about our heart and our life and our peace. But we are not meant to be alone. The story continues, and Paul Saul's real change happens when Jesus gets the community involved. Because Acts chapter 9 does not just tell the story of Jesus appearing to Saul, who will become Paul, who will become a Christian superstar, you know, this missionary whose journey we hear about, who writes the Bible. It's also the story of Jesus appearing to a man named Ananias. And uh, Ananias isn't famous. Um, 
Doesn't help he shares a name with like a bad guy from a few chapters ago. It was a common name. Um, but Ananias in this story is one of the heroes of scripture. And who he is, is an ordinary follower of Jesus. Ananias is you. He's me. He's, he's a part of the church in Damascus that Paul came to persecute. You could say he's just a guy, but, but is he? Because he's a follower of Jesus. And if he's a follower of Jesus, it means the mission of Jesus in the world is his. So Jesus shows up not just to guy who will become a superstar, but to Ananias as he's praying and says his name again. I know you're Ananias. Have I got a job for you? There's a man named Paul, Saul. There's a man named Saul who I've told to be ready for you. I love that Jesus seems to have told Saul what's going to happen before he asks Ananias about it. Um, who's really in charge here? It's not us, it's God. Jesus goes to Ananias. And Ananias has doubts, right? He's an ordinary guy. He's already heard what Saul's here to do. You know, are you sure, Lord? And Jesus says, yes. I know my plan for him. And I'm going to bring it about through you. Ananias receives a vision from Jesus as well. Less dramatic, less grand. He doesn't go blind. Uh, but it's a powerful vision nonetheless. And he does what he's called to do. Ananias lets Jesus change his mind about someone else. And then comes the third encounter with the risen Lord Jesus in this story. Ananias goes into the house of Saul's friend Judas, goes down and meets this man who has the power to arrest him. And the first word out of his mouth is brother. Brother Saul. And I think in that moment, Saul meets Jesus again. And we've already seen hints that this is going to happen. Remember on the road, uh, Jesus says to Saul, 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 why are you persecuting me? It, at this point, Jesus has died. He's risen. He's safe in heaven. Has Paul been rounding Jesus up? Has Paul been having people throw stones at Jesus? Has Paul been given letters to arrest Jesus? No. He's doing that to Jesus' followers. But Jesus says, you're doing that to me. In other words, Jesus is saying he's in those who believe in him. He suffers when, when we suffer. He's here with us. And so, less dramatically, Saul meets Jesus again as a member of the community of Christ is willing to call him brother. Brother Saul. Ananias knows his name too. Jesus sent me. And he prays for, prays for him and the scales fall from his eyes and he can see again and he's baptized and then Saul gets on the mission. He becomes a powerful part of that community doing Jesus' work. Now, in some ways, this uh, series on dramatic encounters with God and the way God shows up to different you know, prophets and people in the Bible, um, part of what I'm trying to do is to say that still happens, right? God will still be present in those powerful ways to you and me today. Um, 
But those powerful individual moments are never the end of the story. We always get back to the community. We're, we get stuck with church, not the building. We get stuck with each other. We become family with each other and we meet Jesus in each other. Ananias isn't famous. There's no indication that he's a church leader or anything. He's just a guy, but he's not. Because he follows Jesus. And he's willing to let Jesus change him. Change his mind. Change his direction. The big miracle gets Paul to stop going down the dead end road. And the community helps him find his new calling. Jesus in the community sends Paul out into the rest of the world and, I mean, find someone other than Jesus who's changed the world more than the Paul he'll become. I believe that we're called to do the same thing as Christ's community now. If you are a follower of Jesus, if you've been baptized, um, you're like Ananias. And Jesus is planning to use you to change someone's life. And maybe each of us has our own dead ends that we're on. But know and trust and believe that the Lord will come and turn us around. And we're meant to find our path, our new path in life's grand adventure with each other. And if we're with each other, then we're also with Jesus. Because I've seen the love of Jesus Christ in some of your eyes. I've met Jesus through you. Let's come together and shine with that light and that love. Amen. Let us pray. Loving God, we thank and praise you for your constant gifts to us, for your love and mercy that never end, for your love for each one of us as individuals and your love for us as a community. And Lord, uh, we lift up to you the communities around us. In this time when um, things are beginning to open up and feel uh, safe again, help us to uh, to love one another, not just the ways we used to, but in the new ways you call us to. May we transform our community. May we share your love as your church together. Lord, um, you've called us together as followers of Jesus to be one church, uh, and you've called us as a church to live in a community and be a blessing to it. And so we pray um, for the city of Sarnia, and for other places where we may live. We pray for our own neighborhoods. We, um, we pray for people who think they're alone right now and need your help. We pray that you will send someone, or um, we each pray that you will send us to someone who needs us. Help us to be a voice that changes their life. Lord God, we pray for those uh, trapped in different addictions and uh, those who are uh, struggling to help them. We pray for those who've been trapped by um, society's story and the legacy of violence that goes back generations. And in particular, we pray for those 
who were at or whose parents were at um, residential schools and suffered that violence. We pray for a new beginning, an end to the dead end road of superiority, and a new life together in this country. We pray for a new beginning um, in our relationship to the earth and for its healing. We pray for our own selves, our own hearts and minds, that you will show us your path for us, that you will help us to help one another to find it. Lord God, pour out your spirit on your church and make us your holy people. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. And now may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion, the oneness of the Holy Spirit be with you all, now and forever. Amen. <laughs>